I want you to hit me as hard as you can. In August of 1962, the 15th issue of a comic book called Amazing Fantasy hit the newsstands, and the world changed as a result. Why? Because it introduced one of the most unique and cool superheroes of all time, Spider-Man. Of course, I'm not saying that other superheroes like Superman or Batman weren't amazing, but Spider-Man was special. While many readers love to read about a billionaire dressing up like a flying rat to fight crime, Spidey was just a regular teenager who still had to deal with bullies and juggle relationships while fighting menacing supervillains. All thanks to his two creators, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Okay, let me stop right now. By just saying Lee and Ditko, there's gonna be people in the comments fighting over this. Yes, I am aware there's much debate over who created Spider-Man. Was it Lee and Ditko? Was it just Ditko? Was it even Kirby? Well, I am not going to go down that rabbit hole, because the point of this video is to talk about the very first actor to play Spider-Man, Nicholas Hammond. Wrong, 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 wrong. Okay, god damn it! Yes, I know Danny Seagrin technically did play Spider-Man on The Electric Company, but that was only in small sketches and he did not talk, so I don't think he counts. No, it was Nicholas Hammond who portrayed Peter Parker in his adventures as Spider-Man, as the star of the Amazing Spider-Man TV series, which ran for one TV movie and two seasons on CBS for a total of 11 episodes. And even though this show got some amazing ratings, it was canned by the network. So why would a show that was so popular wind up seemingly becoming the shame of Marvel Comics? Why has it been buried all of these years? Well, let us find out in this episode of Gone But Not Forgotten. Due to the success of the Spider-Man sketches on The Electric Company, Stan Lee took advantage of the character's popularity on television by approaching CBS with the rights to a live-action Spider-Man show. Kicking off with a Spider-Man TV movie, which starred Sound of Music co-star Nicholas Hammond as Peter Parker, in addition to David White as J. Jonah Jameson, Hilly Hicks as Joe Robbie Robertson, Jeff Donnell as May Parker, and Michael Pataki as an original character, Captain Barbara. The TV movie was a hit that became the highest performing CBS production for 1977, proving so popular that it was actually released overseas as a theatrical film. So CBS immediately put into production a TV series called The Amazing Spider-Man, which aired from September 1977 to July 1979. But the cast was switched up a bit, beginning with Jonah now being played by Robert F. Simon. According to Hammond, David White was unavailable to come back for the show because he was dealing with a possible nervous breakdown. And Simon played JJ a bit different than David White did, whose portrayal was more dismissive and annoyed at Peter, while Simon played JJ more as a judgmental dick and a cheapskate, along the lines of Ebenezer Scrooge. Although there were a few times you could see him treat Peter a little bit better, only to be immediately followed by a dick move. This really makes the whole trip worthwhile. As a matter of fact, you know, I've got, to, I've got to let you have this whole suite here for the rest of the week at my expense. That is really nice of you. Thank you. But, Mr. Jameson, today is Friday. There are only two more days left in the week. Well, what do you want for nothing? Wow. What a dick. But one glaring difference from the comics was that J. Jonah Jameson was actually indifferent towards Spider-Man. Seriously, the most we ever got out of him was this. To take all the credit, but I have to admit I couldn't have pulled it off without Spider-Man. Oh, well, he'd be delighted to hear you say that, Captain. Do you mind if the Bugle quotes you on that? Not on your life. I'm not giving any recognition to some freak who runs around in a red and blue Union suit. JJ's character would change again in Season 2, but we'll get to that later. For now, let us focus towards the original character of Captain Barbera. Barbera was your typical grumpy and rude NYC detective that you would see on TV back in the day. Actually, he was a little bit more like J. Jonah Jameson, in that he was quick to complain about Spider-Man interfering, and sometimes maybe even being partially responsible for the crime. He was also annoyed that Parker was always pestering him at the crime scene. And finally, we're introduced to Rita Conway, played by Chip Fields, 
Rita was a replacement for Robbie Robertson, who had been in the TV movie pilot. And it's been theorized by fans that she's actually an adaptation of the Spider-Man character, Glory Grant. But I completely disagree with that. I actually think she's more like Betty Brant. Yes, like Glory and Betty, she is also JJ's secretary. But I felt she had more drive like Betty did. She was smart and could manipulate Jonah to help Peter on numerous occasions. And she was also not afraid to stand up to Jameson, even if it could have cost her her job. But she knew that JJ saw her as a daughter and would never let anything happen to her, which was shown in the episode called Wolfpack, where Rita is mind-controlled into committing a crime and JJ does everything he can to clear her name. However, the true star of the show was Nicholas Hammond, and I really enjoyed his portrayal of Peter. He played Peter as such an earnest character, who was smart and kind and always wanted to do the right thing. Although he did come off a bit creepy in the episode called Curse of Rava, where he stalks a girl to get information on a possible cult. Well, how'd you know I'd be coming this way? Because your next class is in the chem building, which is right over there. How'd you know that? Oh, a good reporter never reveals his sources. How did you get in here? The window. Do you do that a lot? Um, just the past couple of months. Yikes. But all kidding aside, Hammond took this role very seriously, as he wanted to play Peter as a real person and not a character from a comic book. It kind of reminds me of Tobey Maguire's portrayal of Peter Parker in Sam Raimi's Spidey movies. The show focused on Peter's college years, much like the John Romita and Stan Lee run of the Spider-Man comic, and the best example of this is in the first two episodes of season one called The Deadly Dust, both of which were repackaged as the film Spider-Man Strikes Back, which was also shown in theaters outside the states. In these two episodes, Peter and his classmates protest a professor who has procured plutonium from the government for an experiment. The professor insists that there is no danger, as it's just a small amount which will be guarded. But three college students who are friends with Peter decide to steal it. And what is their goal? What are they going to do? You built a bomb. To prove how easy it was, we weren't going to explode it. We're going to give it back. <laughs> oh, yeah. That makes perfect sense! While all that is happening, Peter gets assigned with a reporter from another paper to track down the missing plutonium. And this reporter's name is, um, well, I think Peter's reaction says it all here. Mr. Jameson. Mr. Parker. How nice to meet you. I have been looking forward to this. Well, it's very nice to meet you too, Miss... Miss Hoffman. Um, wow, okay, uh, moving on. The reporter's name is Gail Hoffman, played by Joanna Cameron, and some of you who watch TV in the 70s may know her as the star of another superhero show called Isis, and modern audiences may know that character from DC's Legends of Tomorrow, although she's no longer called Isis because TV executives think that audiences cannot tell the difference between a person called Isis and the terrorist organization of the same name. Again, that makes perfect sense. Morons. Hammond said that while filming these episodes, everybody was joking that the episode should have been called Spider-Man and Isis. In fact, there was even talk of actually trying to do a crossover episode. But clearly, that did not happen. Anyway, the episode shows these idiots going through with making the bomb. But don't worry, they're being careful. The radiation cannot hurt them because they're wearing sweaters. Of course, don't you idiots know what blocks radiation? Wool? <coughs> of course, an evil arms dealer comes to learn about the bomb and sends his henchmen to look for it, as one of the college students tragically gets sick from radiation. Weren't you guys monitoring the radiation levels? I thought we were. We thought wrong. Feel alright? I'm fine. 
But I wasn't working directly with the plutonium like Connor was. You fool! Don't you know that the radiation shielding of the sweater is negated when you put a lab coat over it? But I do love this episode, mostly because of the sheer 1970s of it all. The clothes, the acting, and of course the obsession with Kung Fu. You see, the henchmen in this episode don't carry guns. Uh, fuck no, they carry real weapons, like ninja stars and nunchucks. Who the hell needs a gun when you can do a bad karate kick? So our bad guy captures Isis and... Very nice. Why do I have to dress this way? <laughs> well, my dear, that's because teenage boys watch this show. Wink, wink. Although it's a little long at times, The Deadly Dust is a fun episode, and I can see why this ended up being repackaged as a film overseas. Now let's move on to talking about the best aspect of this show, the stunts. Whenever I speak to somebody about the 70s Spider-Man TV show, I always hear them making fun of the bad green screen or the obvious ropes made to look like webbing. But if you really watch this series, you'll see some insane stunts that you could never do in film or TV today. We've got a real person swinging from one building to another here, as well as a person dressed like Spider-Man who's literally crawling up a building. And one of the most impressive stunts was in the Season 1 episode, A Matter of State, where Spider-Man crawls up the Empire State Building. I swear to God I had to rewind this scene because I could not believe that there was actually a guy climbing up the Empire State Building. Also, I love this guy who pokes his head out of his window to see Spider-Man climbing past his office on the 50th floor. Did I just see Spider-Man outside my window? And fun fact, the crowds filmed on the street here were not extras. They were just people who were amazed at seeing a comic book character climbing up one of the most famous buildings in the world. Man, you've got to love those 1970s safety regulations for stuntmen. So people make fun of these effects while they're perfectly okay with Tobey Maguire turning into a cartoon. But the stunts performed on the first episode of the second season, The Captive Tower, were my favorite of the series. The plot of this episode was basically the plot of Die Hard, a group of thieves trying to steal a million dollars from a high-tech building. And the acting here is good all around in this episode, although there is one guy whose character was in love with the sophistication of the building's computer system. However, it comes off more like... She hasn't made a sound. I asked her not to. We can do whatever we want now and she won't make any protest ever. Yes. She's one of a kind. Um, buddy, should I call someone? Do you need to be left alone? You can revise the program. Of course I can. She doesn't know how to say no to me. You see, the more sophisticated the lady, the more vulnerable she is to someone who knows it well. And we've spent a lot of time together, haven't we? Jesus, this show was weird. But the main scene I love from this episode is when Spidey saves one of the thieves' lives, after he's dangling from a window cleaner's scaffold. It's amazing to watch, mostly because of the first-person camera shots. And I am 99% sure the fear in that stuntman's face was 99% real. The stuntman who played Spider-Man was a former trapeze artist named Fred Waugh, who actually developed the helmet camera that he used for these stunts and other point-of-view shots, which left me so anxious I actually had to pause the episode and go take a breather. Hammond says that he was only Spider-Man for about 20% of the time, so kind of like how Lou Ferrigno portrayed the Hulk and Bill Bixby portrayed Bruce Banner. I guess you could say that Nicholas Hammond was Peter Parker, while Fred Waugh was Spider-Man. And funnily enough, there has been a lot of confusing information about whether or not this Spider-Man show and the Incredible Hulk show were planning a crossover together. According to an interview with Nick Hammond in SFX Magazine, he and Bill Bixby used to talk on the phone quite a bit, and one day Bixby proposed to him an idea for a Spider-Man Incredible Hulk TV movie, which would supposedly feature Spidey wearing his famous black outfit. But Universal lied by saying that Ferrigno was not available to play the Hulk at the time due to his work on Hercules, while Ferrigno said that he was never actually asked. So, it was obviously a rights dispute on who would get more money, Universal or Columbia. And so, the Spidey Hulk crossover went nowhere. 
However, while researching this episode, I listened to another interview with Hammond on the Comic Book Central podcast, where he said that there was talk with him and Bixby while the show was still on the air of doing a crossover, but it did not happen because of Bixby's death. But Bill Bixby died in 1993, which would make this clearly impossible. So, which version is true? Was Hammond just misremembering? Possibly. Personally, I like the Universal vs. Columbia version of that story better. It just seems cooler. And if you get a chance, by the way, listen to that Nicholas Hammond episode of the Comic Book Central podcast. He has got some great anecdotes. So Season 2 introduced some major changes to the cast. Captain Barbera was dropped, and we were introduced to Julie Masters, played by Ellen Bry, a rival photographer and love interest to Peter. But the one ridiculous change was the new personality for J. Jonah Jameson, which was, um, well... I'll give you five minutes at the most. Your Honor, Peter Parker is an honorable and honest man. Season 2 episodes were still pretty good, with the two-part series finale, The Chinese Web, being repackaged as a third film named Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge, which was again shown in theaters overseas. And I can see why, because this is a great episode, with guest star appearances by Rosalind Chow, who many of you may know as Keiko on Star Trek The Next Generation, and even Ted Danson in one of his first gigs. Now, many Spider-Man fans have issues about the faithfulness of the show to its source material. There's no Uncle Ben, Aunt May isn't really in the show all that much, plus the belt and the wristbands, I mean, come on! But if you compare it to The Incredible Hulk, which I know has more fans, I think that the Spider-Man show is way more faithful than The Hulk show was. For one thing, it featured the Spider-Tracer. I mean, when you disregard the belt and the bulky web shooters, this costume is actually more faithful to the comics than a lot of other adaptations. But people always focus on either the belt or the eyes on his costume, which had to be designed that way so they wouldn't fog up. After all, walking on the edge of 50-story buildings with fogged up eyewear is practically a death sentence. Also, I understand why people hate his belt, but hey, Spider-Man had a belt in the comics, Granted, it was under his costume, but still. Another common complaint is the lack of villains in the show. But let's be realistic. Can you tell me what Spider-Man villains you could have had on a 70s TV show? Not Dr. Octopus. That was nearly impossible, even in the Sam Raimi movies. Green Goblin? I would personally argue that no one's gotten that character right. I could only really think of two. Kraven the Hunter and possibly Mysterio. If you want to take a leap with me here, the episode called The Kirkwood Haunting is kind of similar to Spider-Man's latest movie, Far From Home, as it involves a criminal using a special effects crew to fool a widow out of her money. So yeah, you could say that's Mysterio. Also, there's even an episode where Spider-Man fights a clone of himself, which is straight out of the comics. But the fans were not the only ones complaining about the show's direction. Years later, Stan Lee said that he argued with the producer of the show, Daniel R. Goodman, and thought that the show was too juvenile. But decades later, Goodman said that it was actually the other way around. It was Goodman who wanted to ground the character in reality, while Stan Lee wanted to make the show more like a comic book on TV. But regardless, CBS pulled the plug on the show, as it could not find an audience due to the network always moving the show's time slot around. CBS's theory was that if they aired Spider-Man behind different hit shows, it would get higher ratings. The problem was that there was no real advertising back then, so no one would know that the show was going to air. Some people say that this was deliberate, as CBS was scared that they would become known as the Superhero Network. They were airing The Incredible Hulk and Wonder Woman on a regular schedule, Shazam and Isis was on Saturday mornings, not to mention the Captain America and Doctor Strange TV movies. Huh, they feared being labeled a superhero TV network? Man, I wonder where I've heard that one before. So again we ask, should this show come back? Should there be a new live-action Spider-Man TV show? Well, probably not. Because if the Spider-Man movies have taught us anything, it's that Spidey should always be on the big screen. 
I think maybe Miles Morales could possibly work as a WandaVision-like limited series, but I don't know. That just wouldn't feel right. I think the better question to ask is why this show is not on any streaming services or Blu-ray or even DVD. As of this recording, you cannot find this show anywhere except on VHS tapes, bootlegs, or maybe YouTube. I just do not understand Marvel's continued method of trying to bury their shame. Whether it's the Spider-Man show, or Roger Corman's Fantastic Four movie, which had its negatives bought and burned by Avi Arad to avoid it tarnishing the brand. I always say that you shouldn't hide from your mistakes, you should stand by them. Sometimes even great Marvel shows are either out of print or only released overseas on DVD, such as Marvel Super Heroes or the 1960s Spider-Man cartoon. But thankfully, we've been getting lucky lately, as some of these shows have become available for streaming on Disney+, Plus, such as Spider-Woman, Iron Man, and the Spider-Man animated series from the 90s. And there are rumors of the 1970s Amazing Spider-Man show finally getting some kind of U.S. release. One can only hope. But I speak as one fan who hopes that we will once again see bad teeth, stupid fights, and horrible 1970s fashion choices brought back to the Marvel Universe. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web, and he slides, catches thieves, just like flies, look out! Here comes Spider-Man! One out, one out, one out! Is he strong? Listen, bud! He's a radioactive bud! Can he swing from a thread? Take a look, overhead! Hey there! In the chill of night, at the scene of the crime, like a streak of light, he arrives just in time. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, wealth and fame, he's ignored, action is his... I'm Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of David Arroyo for JoeBlow.com, and thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel, tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support, and we will see you next time for the next installment of Gone But Not Forgotten.